yeah we have uh, now covered john chapter 3 up to verse 15 uh, so we will continue from verse 16 onwards uh, now verse 16 is uh, a very familiar verse and it says for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life and uh, so over here jesus very directly uses the term one and only son so he is uh, saying uh, i'm not only the son of man who was discussed in uh, daniel chapter 7 i am also the son of god so he makes that very clear that he's not just some kind of a human messiah but that he is divine he refers to his divinity over here um and then uh, what else uh, over here when it says believes in him obviously it's not talking about just a intellectual belief because even the demons believe that jesus exists and that jesus is the son of god they know that they have seen that so it's not talking about just some kind of intellectual belief but it's talking about a belief in action where you choose to trust that person and submit to that person and obey that person uh, so that becomes a, a true belief uh, in, in the sense you believe to the extent where you're willing to act upon it and completely yield to that person so um, it's talking about that kind of a uh, deeper level of belief uh, where you choose to submit to this person whom you completely believe in and uh, so uh, another important phrase that we see in uh, verse 16 is that whosoever is the term so it doesn't matter which nation the person belongs to if they are willing to believe in jesus and to the extent of completely submitting to him and uh, accepting him as their lord over their lives then that person whosoever he may be wherever in the world he may be uh, whichever nation he may belong to uh, he can enter into the kingdom of god now this of course would have been a very shocking statement for the jewish people because they always believe that it is the descendants of abraham alone who will uh, make it into heaven um, and of course anyone else who is willing to come and um, worship the um the 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 god of the israelites uh, for instance you have outsiders like naaman who placed his faith in yahweh and you have ruth who chooses to come and make yahweh her god so they are okay with that idea you know of outsiders coming uh, to israel and uh, placing their faith in yahweh so such people can get into the kingdom of heaven but people who are living out there somewhere who have no kind of uh, connections to Israel at all, such people now being openly offered the kingdom of God just because they have placed their belief in and trust in this Messiah, to them, this would have been a shocking uh, statement. Okay, we'll now look at verses 18 and 19. I just very briefly touched upon verse 16 because we have heard many sermons about it. Uh, so I, I just wanted to just you know bring out a few points regarding verse 16. Um, and uh, um, so now if we can look at 17 to 19, if someone could read out for us, 17, 18, 19. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be safe. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he, has, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Um, and, this is, hmm. and this is the condemnation that that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil yes so uh, when the light comes the light reveals the defects which are there and then at that point of time the person would have to decide am i going to hold on to these uh, defects these sins which i see in myself or am i going to be willing to give them up and submit myself to God. So the one of the important things that Jesus did was that he brought light into the world. The Nicodemus and all of his other 
you know uh, godly friends they were people who were trying to lead good lives they were not necessarily evil and so they were they were probably quite satisfied with who they were but then when this light comes they suddenly are able to see things which they have not seen before you know we we uh, notice this especially in a dark room um i remember many years ago when uh, uh, i you know i had a very busy schedule at that time so i came back home late in the evening one day and it had, it had, it had already uh, started to grow dark and there was a park cut so i could not uh, you know there was no light in the house but i was determined to finish my cleaning because you know i had, it had been pending for so many days so i took up a broom and i began to sweep and i thought i had done quite an excellent job I and mean, I, i just had a candle i lit a candle and i kept it in a corner and i did my sweeping and i really thought i had done a great job and then when the power supply came back and the tube light went on i could see these little dust bunnies along the uh, wall and i was like shocked i thought i had done such an excellent job of cleaning but now when this bright tube light came on i could see those dust bunnies in the corner which i had i thought i had swept everything inside uh so when the light really comes in it reveals things which you never even knew and so when jesus comes and starts saying you know even if a person just looks upon a, on, on someone with lust uh that becomes adultery so everything now becomes um, uh, more clear in the light of what he is saying he is revealing things which people were thought were thought were quite fine but now he is saying no that's not enough there's a higher standard that you need to you know live up to and uh, so when the light came into the world when jesus came and started saying that this is actually god's standards people began to realize that what what seemed okay up to then uh, up to the i mean up to that point of time was actually not good enough at all they could now see dirt which had been hidden earlier which they thought was okay earlier and uh, so when the light came into the world uh, a lot of people didn't like it because you see they were enjoying their level of spirituality uh, especially here in our day and age you have a lot of people you know on youtube talking about uh, how they love spiritual things and they and they say you know i regard myself as a spiritual person and they use this word spiritual a lot but when you look at their lifestyles and the standards that they are following um you see that they are in no way meeting the expectations of god uh, but they think that they are so spiritual and so such people will not like it when god lays down his standards and says see this is what i am expecting of you this is the level of godliness that i require and such people will not like it they don't like that much exposure to light they would like to keep the light dim where a lot of stuff just gets covered up you know just it just is there in the corners hidden away and um, they look good they feel good but when the bright light of jesus comes in no hidden corners everything gets exposed and so such people they love the darkness and so they try to avoid the light you know they are not very happy with having the light being shown upon them completely so which is why it says in verse 20 everyone who does evil hates the light and yeah maybe in fact if you could read out uh, if someone could read out for us verses 20 and 21 for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed but he who does the does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have done in god yes uh so um the world and believers um you know approach this in two different ways there are a whole lot of people who prefer not to go to church because when they go and sit over there in the church they are reminded about things that they'd rather not think about um they are aware that there are certain standards and that god regards some things as right and some things as wrong so they try to avoid going to the church because it makes them feel guilty when they go and sit over there and are reminded of what god wants what god expects 
um, so that would be uh, the people who are not yet believers. Uh, their way of trying to hide from the light is to just avoid all light, avoid any sermons, any preaching, any teaching, avoid, in fact, people who will maybe, um, you know, um, through their godly lives point out how uh, bad they are being in their own choices. So, you know, they try to, they try to avoid all of these things. Believers do have their own way of doing this. Uh, you know, they uh, avoid having meaningful personal devotions because they know if they really go sit there in God's presence and they open the scriptures and really start listening to his voice, he's going to start dealing with issues which they have not dealt with. And uh, so some people even avoid having meaningful long devotions in the Lord's presence because it's going to rake up things which they don't want to, you uh, know, which they want to continue hiding away. Uh, so it is so important that we come into this uh, bright tube light, you know, I mean, like in, in, my, in my illustration, uh, as long as that room was in candlelight, it looked so clean. But the minute that tube light came on, I could see things that I had not seen before. And uh, we need to have that experience on a daily basis when we are having our quiet time. So just rushing through a couple of verses and saying, I've done my Bible study for the day is rather meaningless. You've not sat over there and allowed the tube light to really shine upon you, uh, upon your heart. Uh, because only when that happens, then God starts reminding you of things that you need to take care of, things that you would need to submit and yield, uh, you know, and uh, uh, sins that you have to get rid of. So um, uh, this is something very important for us. We should not be like the people who hate the light. Rather, we should be willing to come into the light, spend time over there with him so that he can expose the things which we have not yet dealt with um, you know it can be simple things like the way we have spoken when we interacted with someone uh, the attitude with which we did one particular good deed you know the wrong attitude maybe grumbling unwilling all these little things they get so exposed when you come and sit in his presence because the holy spirit starts reminding us of those things and saying see those are areas where you need to correct yourself because that is not christ likeness and uh, so it is so important for us to have this experience every day where you have the bright tube light, uh, you know, uh, shining down upon your heart. And uh, which is what you know, even David says, right, in the Old Testament. He says, Lord, uh, uh, you know, search my heart and, and, you know, see if there is any wicked way. He genuinely wanted the, the flashlight to be fully put upon his heart so that all these hidden things can come out. And uh, we need to have that same attitude where we are willing to have this bright light of Jesus, his word shining upon us so that the things which are hidden in the corners can be taken care of. All right. Um, we'll uh, now come into John chapter 3, 22 onwards. So maybe if we could have one person read out uh, 22 to 26, please. Yeah. John chapter 3, 22. Ma'am, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in any near Salim. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute among some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to, who, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Okay, so... Um, John... Um... Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, up to 26 should be enough. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, you. yeah. So over here, we see um, a very interesting statement being made in verse 25. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew 
over what matter? The matter of ceremonial washing. Okay, so now some scholars they say maybe the certain Jew over here is Nicodemus because just now Nicodemus, you know, has uh, had this conversation with Jesus uh, and he's been told about how a person should be uh, washed with. Uh, born of water and the spirit uh, and he has understood that there is more to uh, having a clean heart than just simply you know doing some good deeds he is more aware of these things so maybe they say he probably picked an argument with john's disciples and pointed out to them that what they are doing is good but it is not enough because they are doing a baptism of water uh, which is a symbolic way of saying, I am now repenting of all the sinful things that I have been doing and I want to be a better person. So um, this, uh, this ceremonial purification process through the water baptism, which, they, which was being done by John's disciples, is not adequate. And maybe Nicodemus came and was trying to point out that to these people. OK, so John's disciples are basically very unhappy. Up to now, everyone has been you know, respecting John the Baptist. And uh, a lot of people have you know, been convicted of their sins. And they have come genuinely to repent. Uh, because you know, if you see in one of the other Gospels, you have this bunch of soldiers coming. Uh, uh, and uh, they say, what do we do now? You know, because you see, they have they're so convicted of their sins, and they too want to change. And they ask, what what should we do? How should we live now? So all this beautiful revival was going on in the land, and it would have been a great joy to John's disciples to see all this happening in front of their eyes. But now you have this certain Jew is coming over here and is saying to them, what you're doing is not enough. It's part one, step one, but it's not enough. There's something more. And also they are seeing the fact that some of their most sincere followers have now gone away and now they have joined Jesus camp. You know, so which is why uh, they say over here, uh, you know, everyone is going to him because that's exactly what happens, right? Jesus, uh, uh, John uh, the Baptist is speaking to Andrew and to another person whom they say is uh, John the writer. And uh, so he says, you know, look, the Lamb of God. And then they immediately they choose to go and follow Jesus rather than continue with John. So these disciples are now rather disappointed. And they say everyone is going to him. They are very upset about it. Uh, and then we have uh, John's reply. Uh, that would be verse 27, if someone could read out for us, please. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it is as it has been given to him from heaven. Okay, so John is very clear about who he is meant to be, uh, what his uh, task should be, and he's quite satisfied just doing that. So what was given to John from heaven? That he should be the person who will come down and prepare the way, and uh, he should point after having prepared the way, after having helped people you know, repent of their sinful attitudes, he is supposed to point towards the Messiah who can now tell them what they should do next. You know, Once they have repented, what is next? What is to come next? So he knows that that is his task, and that is what has been given to him from heaven. And he's quite satisfied with, with that role which he uh, you know, uh, has been granted. He has no desire to try and become anything greater than that. And uh, so we see this attitude of John the Baptist right from the beginning, you know, right from uh, John chapter one, where we started to look at this person, the Baptist. Uh, he is not a person with any um, uh, wrong, sinful ambitions. Um, and uh, so this is something that uh, has benefited me. Uh, a learning which I have needed, um, especially because I am in full-time ministry. Um, you know, those of us who have been granted by God uh, secular tasks, you know, where we are in, maybe involved in business or we are involved in, uh, uh, you know, the teaching line or uh, whatever it is, software or, uh, you, know, you know, all these other endeavors. So um, we do what we can for the Lord. Uh, you know, we, we share the gospel in our workplace and 
uh, we make sure that we attend Bible study and uh, we, we conduct Bible studies where we teach people. So we are we basically do all of these things. And most of us are quite satisfied that we are serving the Lord, even though, you know, we have all these other secular responsibilities. Uh, but then, you know, um, uh, those of us who are fully involved in full time ministry, uh, we think, oh, God has given me this task. But I wish I could have that task because, you know, uh, there are people out there who are apostles and there are people out there who are preachers. And then uh, there are those who are who are uh, evangelists and they go all to, uh, you know, all over and and conduct these huge meetings. And and you look at the role that you have been given and you look at all the roles which other people have been given and you think, oh, I wish I could have those things. Uh, that I think is an ambition which tends to form more in the hearts of those who are in full time ministry rather than in the hearts of the other you know believers who are serving God. And uh, so for me, this was a very uh, uh, useful learning. Uh, and uh, what John is saying over here is uh, can also you know be further explained if we look at First Corinthians chapter three verses five to ten. And the only reason that I'm touching upon this at all is because you know um, many of us uh, who have joined for this course, you know, we may be thinking about a greater role, uh, a larger role in ministry, and uh, so this is something that would be very useful to us. So if we could have one person read out 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. First Corinthians 3. 5 to 10. OK. And it reads, Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Five up to ten, all the way up to oh, ten. Oh, to ten, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, yes, I'm sorry. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planted anything, Neither he that water it, but God that give it the increase. Now that he planted, and he that water it are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. We are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as wise Master builder, I have laid a foundation and another build it thereon, but let every man take heed how we build it thereupon. Yes. Uh, so over here, there's some very uh, you know significant points that come across in this passage. Uh, one main thing that we see in verse five uh, is where it says, "As the Lord has assigned to each his task." So in the same way, from heaven above, John had been assigned one task and he was quite satisfied doing that. Now, different people have different tasks, but they all have one purpose that we see in verse eight, where it says, you know, one person is planting, the other person is watering, but they all have one purpose to build God's kingdom. And uh, uh, so each will be rewarded according to their own labor. How well have they done their planting or how well have they done their watering? And uh, then in verse 10, there's something very significant. You know, the last part of verse 10, uh, where it says in the NIV, but each one should build with care. So whatever role we have been given from heaven, uh, because, you know, John says a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. So it does not matter what particular task we have been given from heaven, but do that part with great care because we are doing it for God's people. We are doing it for God's kingdom. So how we are doing it becomes very, very uh, important. So um, uh, there are ministries which are not... Uh, given as much uh, popularity and fame as other ministries, 
but they are so vital you know the ministry of hospitality and then uh, uh, the ministry of uh, encourager and the ministry of administration these are all ministries if you see they are like foundational i mean if you did not have people who are moving in the in the in the you know in the in the ministry gift of hospitality and administration and encouragement and all of that you would hardly have uh, any work getting done because these are all very foundational for uh, for the work to really progress and prosper so how those particular people are building you know becomes so important uh, the ones who are um, you know encouragers my goodness the words that they speak from the word of god to people for their specific situations it can really you know build up a person in inside on, on the inside and it would give them the confidence to go forth and do what god wants them to do without that encourager where would we be uh, you know so these are all ministries which are not granted uh, much uh, popularity in the world but they are so vital so it really does not matter what we have been given from heaven to do uh, so you know you may be a person uh, who works in the secular field because that's what god has assigned to you and so your area of ministry will be in your workplace where you are trying to you know um, uh, uh, be encouraging being helpful and whenever you get a chance to pray for people and maybe just share with them and say you know jesus has helped me with these things and so in the same way he can help you with your situations so in your own way you are doing your ministry over there uh, but if you are doing it with care like it says in the last part of 10 if you are doing your part with care then you are truly building his kingdom in a, in a, in a, you know in a most glorious way so john was very satisfied with what he had been given and he Uh, knew that if he does his part with care that should be more than uh, sufficient and um, you know uh, just to uh, touch upon another point uh, um, we when we look at acts chapter 6 where it talks about uh, you know how um, they appointed some people to help out with the uh, food distribution for the widows um, and uh, the kind of terminology that is used over there regarding these people who were supposed to be now in charge of uh, food distribution uh, if we can maybe very specifically look at uh, three or four verses from there from that passage uh, because that too can you know um, uh, help us think in the correct way regarding these things acts chapter 6 uh, if someone could read out 3 4 5 and 6 so acts chapter 6 verses 3 to 6 and it reads yes wherefore brethren look ye out among you seven men of honest report full of the holy ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over these over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and the holy ghost and Philip the porcos and Nicanor and Timion and Parmenas and Nicholas a a, a proselyte of uh, of Antioch you said 3 to 5 Six were successful. Six, whom, whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. All right. So uh, here we are talking about uh, one particular ministry responsibility, which is basically distribution of food to the widows. Okay, because um, uh, there was some neglect in this uh, area, and so now uh, they want to appoint new people for this task. so this is not exactly church planting that they are doing they are going to be distributing food um they are not going to be standing on a pulpit and preaching they are just going to be dividing the food packets in such a way that everyone gets an equal amount of uh, uh, you know food and uh, groceries uh, so that kind of a thing so it's basically uh, something like uh, grocery in charge you know food in charge It doesn't sound very uh, uh, religious or spiritual 
but look at the kind of uh, requirements that are uh, you know uh, placed for this particular posting they want people who are going to be full of the holy spirit and wisdom the the people who are going to be doing grocery distribution need to be full of the spirit and wisdom and uh, one of the persons who is chosen is stephen how is he described he's described as a man full of faith and the holy spirit so it's not just some person with a casual attitude uh, and casual qualifications who is doing going to be doing this grocery distribution it's going to be a man who is full of faith and full of the holy spirit and they regard this area of ministry so important that it says over there in verse 6 that they prayed and laid hands upon them and dedicated them to the task with which was given so um we fail to realize that whatever has been given from heaven you know the, the wording which john uses what is given them from heaven is what he says so we sometimes fail to realize that whatever task we have been assigned from heaven we fail to realize that it is as important as the more popular uh, you know ministries so if a person is engaged in the ministry of hospitality which involves a lot of logistics which involves a lot of you know um, uh, interacting with people and uh, sorting out things and looking after their uh, you know comfort and oh my there's so much involved now generally nobody lays hands on the persons involved in that ministry and says you know i now anoint you in the name of jesus and dedicate you to this task and that is why we think that oh maybe that ministry is not not that important but the point is all these tasks have been given from heaven above and they are all of are equally important and valuable so the people in whatever ministry area they are in uh, you know whether it is in the secular field or in full time ministry they need to be very careful how they are building because over there it says in first corinthians 3 verse 10 build with care so whatever task you have been doing it doing it do it with great care because uh, even if no human lays his hand upon you and anoints you for the task heaven itself the lord himself has anointed you for that particular task and in his eyes it is something very important uh, so all that we are doing uh, is all of us have one single purpose we are all trying to build the kingdom of god and you know uh, fulfill his purposes and plans so whatever area we have been given area of ministry we have been given whether it is in the secular field or in the church we must build with care uh, because it is important in the eyes of god all right so then we'll uh, uh, finally come down to the last portion uh, which talks about the bridegroom and bride imagery uh, so if we can have someone read out john chapter 3 uh, verses 28 to 30. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, that this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Okay, so over here, uh, John makes it very plain to his disciples who are feeling very bad because uh, uh, John is getting overshadowed by Jesus. And uh, so John points out and he says, no, no, this is the way it should be. Because you see, he is the bridegroom. I am just the person who was helping the bridegroom, preparing the way for the bridegroom. So obviously the bridegroom has to become greater and I must become less and this uh, this very important point that comes across over here that um, the bride the church the body of believers they belong to the bridegroom so we may be doing a lot to help the church to help the believers to build them up uh, but we must never forget that these people are not our possessions they actually belong to Jesus, the bridegroom. So he always has the final say over them, over their lives, uh, over their decisions. Um, we can only advise, we can only help. We are called upon to assist, to equip, but 
we must never forget that these people are not our possessions they are uh, belong to the bridegroom um and that's a very important thing for us to remember because you know we are maybe people who are pastoring churches uh, we may be bible study leaders and we are leading the group and we are giving them spiritual food every week um you know uh, so we may be in these positions of authority where uh, uh, the people who whom god has given to us are looking up to us they're looking up to us for guidance uh they're looking up to us for uh, you know prayer support and for uh, counseling regarding different things and so when when these situations are you know uh, are there and we can have great influence over these people we need to be very very careful that we are not thinking of them as you know my disciple my follower my property and to whom i can dictate uh, and whom i can uh, you know tell what they should do no always remember that those people who are you know so lovingly and respectfully looking up to you they are not yours they belong to the bridegroom jesus so jesus is the one who should you know have a have a say in uh, the, the decisions which they uh, take uh, in in what they decide to do regarding their future um, so uh, we should be so careful about this and have the same attitude that john the baptist did even though he had invested uh, you know most of his life in preparing the way for the bridegroom uh, the soldiers came to him looking for advice uh, the people who came from the towns and villages they came to him to be baptized um, the religious leaders they came and asked him are you the messiah that we were expecting so everyone was coming to john the baptist and uh, he was playing a very influential role in all of their lives but he never ever forgot the fact that these people who are all coming to him and who are depending upon him they are not his he always made made very sure that he remembered that they are not his they actually belong to the bridegroom so the bridegroom gets to say you know how they should lead their lives what they should do and all that john the baptist is expected to be is to be an advisor to be a person who gives support a person who gives help and is always constantly pointing them back to their groom to their bridegroom because they are married to the lord not to him and um, that should be our attitude so when people come to us and say uh, you know pastor whom should i marry uh, or you know uh, they come to you as a bible study leader and they say you know you, uh, you have so much wisdom you have so much guide, uh, you know guidance regarding the scriptures so you tell me this decision that i want to take is it correct is it wrong i think the first thing that we would have to say as uh, you know people who are ministering is uh what is the lord saying to you about it have you spent time in his presence you know waiting upon him reading the scriptures waiting to hear his voice um i can give you guidance on how you can hear from him i can tell you you know how you can hear from god more clearly i can teach you how to uh, to to depend on god more clearly i can help you in all of these things but ultimately it's his voice that you would have to hear and respond so it would be very wrong for us to just step into that role of the bridegroom and say no you do this 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 who are we to tell that um we can give our advice uh, we can be supportive but they we should equip them to hear for them oh for their for themselves from their groom from their lord we cannot take up the position of lord and say you should do this you should do that because then you know we, there could be a mistake we may actually end up guiding that person into doing something which their lord their groom does not want and that would be so disastrous so it is so important for us to equip people to hear from god directly to hear from their groom after all they're married to him they made the commitment to him and so he must have the right to speak into their lives so we can teach them how to hear from god we can teach them how to grow in god and draw closer to him feel his presence more be sensitive to his guidance we can equip them in all of these areas but we should never be people who will you know dictate to them and tell them you should do this you should do that because i am your leader and i get to decide that would be a wrong attitude uh yeah yeah those are just some thoughts that i want to express on that particular point uh moving on from there into verses 31 um yeah maybe we could just read 31 
uh, yeah. He who come from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly, and is speaks of the earth. Who he who comes from heaven is above all. Yeah, so this is just you know to touch upon what we were, um, what I was saying just now. Uh, so the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. So we are people from the earth, and uh, the Lord has anointed us and placed us in positions of influence where we can influence people. But the thing is, we are limited. The one who is above all, he is the one who knows what is best for the people who are, uh, you know, in our care. So he is the one, the one who knows everything, who is above all. He gets to say uh, what decisions should be taken in their lives. And um, uh, just to continue along those lines, uh, okay, we have a, a person raising their hand. Yeah, we can actually deal with that right now. Please go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Pastor. I just need a clarification on um on the bridegroom part and as you were uh, sharing that one thing mm -hmm. and um uh, then uh, if that is the thing uh, that um, uh, we can only train the people to hear the hear the voice of god then the bible says that god has given us the fivefold ministry to edify the church mm -hmm. and the gifts of the holy spirit so and again the paul says that um, you know all gifts are not given to everyone some speaks in tongues some some do do miracles hmm. so if somebody comes uh, and approach someone and regarding to the prophecy regarding to some counseling because of the he is gifted with the word of wisdom hmm. he is gifted with the word of knowledge and uh, then uh, uh, and uh, and that particular person is uh, gifted for that reason so that the bridegroom could should be edified and the bridegroom should be uh, strengthened so is that wrong for us to uh, to 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 guide them because we are gifted and God has equipped us with that? And second thing uh, we were discussing right now, I just need a clarification on this. Also, where you say where we were discussing, um, and uh, three, he that cometh from the above, and uh, he that is of the earth and is mm -hmm. earthly, and speaketh of the and he that comes to, so we know that uh, he is speaking about Jesus and. Uh, mm -hmm and uh, now the bible says when the when we are born again the bible that clearly says that it, it doesn't mean that born again also means the original text says we are born from we are born from above mm. and the bible says we are seated with him in the in the in christ in the heavenly places mm. so in that case uh, when i am seated with christ i am seated with him so now um, my position is with the christ and so i am i am a new creation in christ in that case how um, you know, the Bible says that the old has gone and the new, new has come and I have, I'm having the seed of God in me. Mm. And, um, you know, so, um, and uh, I and Christ, we are sitting together and God has given the son's position to me. So, mm. so in that case, um, how can I say that? No, how I'm now, you know, uh, you know, Christ is on above and i am below or i'm you hope you are understanding what i want oh to say. yeah yes yeah, yeah yeah so that is the, how can we uh, make it understand because the bible very clearly says that when the born again means born from above that is the meaning of the mm. that is the greek meaning that is also one of the meanings so i just want mm. a clarification mm. of that. thank you pastor yeah so the first point uh we have been uh you know some of us have been uh, given the official uh postings of apostle and teacher and uh, prophet um, i mean uh, we can't really get into the entire uh, subject but then you know if you were to go into uh, pastor ashish sermons where he explains uh, we have uh, the official giftings where that person has been called uh, full time to perform in that particular capacity of an apostle or a prophet and we also have the general uh, you know um, uh, giftings where all believers are uh, meant to move in the gifts so there's a kind of uh, distinction over there you have the official giftings where a person is fully full time called to be an evangelist on the other hand every single believer is supposed to evangelize so we all move in the in the common gifting which is given to all believers to an evangelize and the Lord will go with us and help us even as we testify about him. We also have the official posting of evangelist. So there is a distinction between now. So, I mean, you know, you, you would just need more clarity on that. 
uh, but and then you're probably already familiar with those things. Uh, so yes, there are people who occupy these official postings of full-time calling to that particular gifting, and uh, they would uh, play a very uh, great influence over the people you know who, in their care. And uh, so a person who has the gift of prophecy would be prophesying. He would be saying um, uh, things which he has heard from God. But uh, like they say, all uh, prophets need to be tested. So the believer would know, should, should be taught and equipped how to test the prophecy that he has received. So these are all things that we would be equipping and uh, uh, building up believers to be able to do for themselves. So yes, they would receive ministry from apostles. They would be receiving ministry from prophets, from teachers. Uh, they would be receiving ministry from all of these people. And they would, in fact, be trusting these people and looking up to them and believing what they are saying. But each person, finally, in the end, should be should know, uh, should be able to judge uh, in, a, in, a, in a careful, godly manner. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, discern whether what they are being given is in line with the word of God or not. So one very, very important thing that we should be doing for each person is, even as they are receiving ministry from these fivefold full-time um, people, are they receiving what is correct or are they receiving what is wrong? They should be able to judge and discern for themselves with the help of the scriptures, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And it becomes our responsibility to train people to be able to do that. So yes, the fivefold ministry is in place to edify, to equip. And uh, part of their responsibility in equipping is they should equip each person to be able to discern for themselves whether what is being told is correct or wrong. Uh, so uh, that becomes another aspect of their responsibility. Not only should the prophet just be prophesying, he must also teach the people and say, see, this is the way for you to find out whether the prophecy being given is right or wrong. This is the way you should study the scriptures. This is the way you should grow close, closer to God so that you can hear his voice, voice better. So the prophet should be equipping people to hear directly from God as well. The apostle should be doing that as well. So we do function in our giftings, but we must also make sure that, the, that each person can hear from themselves from the Lord as well. Because only then they will know whether all these human people who are ministering are ministering in the correct way or in the uh, wrong way. So coming to the second aspect, um, uh, we are uh, now born from above and we are seated uh, with Christ uh, in the heavenlies. In the sense, the same authority which he has in his hands, now he is, he is sharing that with us. So the same authority with which he um, does things from his throne, we who are seated with him can also function in that same authority in his name, by using his name, by standing in his uh, power, we can also exercise that same kind of authority. So in that sense, we are definitely from above. But there's also the other side to it, uh, where we are still here on this earth, and we have not yet grown, uh, become perfect. Uh, and we are still growing into the things of God. Um, like uh, even uh, Paul himself who says, you know, I have not yet arrived. I have not yet achieved, but I'm striving. So none of us has uh, ever come into the fullness of what we are meant to be. So um, when it comes to matters of exercising authority and being able to do ministry, yes, we are seated with him. So the same way he sits on his throne and issues uh, you know, orders and is able to accomplish things, we can share in that with him and we can walk in authority in our ministry, uh, in the things that we are doing for the kingdom of God. But uh, just like Paul, we, can, we have to admit that we have not yet fully achieved, we have not yet fully arrived, and we are still learning, which is why there is a chance for you know you and I, I'm not talking about Paul, I'm just talking about you and I, ordinary people like us, when I'm functioning as an apostle, when I'm functioning as a prophet, because I'm still growing into these things, I may make a mistake. And so the people who are in my care should not be affected because I made a mistake. I should equip them right from the beginning 
to be able to read the scriptures for themselves, to understand it, to learn what is right and what is wrong, to be able to discern what is correct, to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit, uh, to be to have a sensitive heart where when maybe the Holy Spirit is warning and saying, no, no, this is not correct. We will immediately be able to catch that. This is something that every person should, uh, you know, the leaders should equip their people to do that because we are all humans who are still learning and growing into these things and none of us have reached perfection as yet. So I hope to some extent that has answered you, uh, your question. Thank you. You explained yes. it very well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, now, uh, the sad thing is we've kind of, you know, run out of time. Um, so uh, what we are basically left with is verses 32 to uh, 35, where it just uh, talks about he testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Uh, whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Um, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So anyway, oh, in, in these verses, uh, John the Baptist is just wrapping up what he has been saying about uh, Jesus. And so he says that Jesus is from God. And so um, everything has been placed in his hands. Uh, so we must accept his testimony because um, God himself is certifying that what the, 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 the testimony which Jesus is giving is the truth. And because God has given the spirit to him without limit, we must, uh, you know, uh, accept him and uh, not reject him. So basically, he's wrapping up all of these thoughts in these uh, words of advice that he is now giving to his uh, disciples who are feeling very bad that their leader is no longer prominent. Okay, so these are some of the things that we uh, dwelt on. Uh, if we could have one person, uh, you know, closing in prayer, please. Um, or maybe I should actually mention a person, right? So, uh, uh, Brother Albuquerque, if you could, you know, just uh, help us close in prayer. Yes. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the session we just had to understand your word, to understand, to be able to get more knowledge about you, God, and to be able to aspire to the things that you have, you, you, are, you want us to achieve. Mm. Oh Lord, we are, we are, we, we look forward to learning more, to help us thirst more for, for more knowledge and help us be in a position to apply this in our daily lives. Yes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we will meet again next week. Thank you.